three. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. My co-host, Scott Todd, is on a much-needed vacation, so it's just going to be me and my guest. And before we talk to our, our guest, and he's a kind of a big deal, I'm going to put on my Anchorman voice, I just want to let everybody know that today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io. It's a set and forget it system on collecting your notes, managing your notes. I used to spend Sundays manually putting into some you know, fas- old fashioned Excel spreadsheet, all this information, and now it's all automated. Set and forget it. Remember, you can always make more money. You can't get more time. All right, now our guest today is Matthew Pollard from matthewpollard.com. If you don't know who Matthew is, he is the youngest big deal I know. He has, with five multi-million dollar business success stories to his name, in industries as vastly different as telecommunications, construction, and nationally accredited education, Matthew has been characterized as a, two, a true differentiation, niche marketing, and sales systemization powerhouse. Sales systemization, I'm very uh, you know, curious to learn more about that. Today, Matthew's acquisition strategy has been effectively used in obtaining clients from multinational award-winning franchises, luxury automotive brands, leading medical institutions, law associations, as well as national Olympic and premier football teams. Let's just get into it. Matthew, you're a big deal. You've been on Entrepreneur, CEO, TV. Matthew Powell, how are you? Good, mate. I'm good. Thank you for having me. And thank you for stopping that introduction. I find everybody summarizes it's there as a, as, as a pointer. But yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. And I, as I get older, which we were just chatting about earlier, the, the older I get, the more you have to summarize and summarize. And all the things that were like a big deal when you were younger, it's like, oh, we got to cross that out now. It's, 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 it's kind of a waste of space in your biography. So thank you very much for having me, mate. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, Matthew, you've been prolific. I mean, you're only 32. You've done all this stuff. Um, let's rewind the tape. And let's start from the very beginning where you're just starting into your entrepreneurial journey. Um, what got you into it and, and how did it all start? Sure. I'd, I'd like to say it was all pre-contrived and that I had a big plan, but honestly, I didn't. And I, I, I feel that a lot of people, when they ask me about how I started out, they hear somebody that obviously is quite extroverted and quite dynamic. So therefore he must've just been natural at this. Well, it's not actually the truth. I mean, I started with, you know, I was, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I was horribly introverted and you know, I'll show you a photo one day of a photo of me with a uh, horrible acne. And you know, that was the face that I went and started my, my, my career with. Now for me, I was, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so what I did is I convinced my father that I would finance myself through the next year by getting a job at a local real estate agency. Now, of course, people would assume naturally, I'm going to be the real estate agent. No, I wasn't. I was the guy in the back office doing the paperwork going, please don't talk to me. I'm the guy that's going to, to, to just, I'm sitting here spinning my wheels trying to find myself. We've all had kids or seen kids that are doing the find themselves thing. That was me until just before Christmas, I lost my job. Now, in, the reason why I lost my job was the company went bankrupt. And you can't help that except for the fact in Christmas, at Christmas time in Australia, we don't exactly take a few days off like Americans do. We take four weeks off. We go away on holidays on the 20th of December and it's our summer break and our Christmas break all at once. And there's not a decision maker to be found from until the 15th to 20th of January. So finding a job is incredibly difficult unless you want to take on a commission only sales job. So that's what I did. I took on a commission only sales job and then I, after five days of product training, terrified as imagining an introvert trying to go out and sell, I then walked down a, a strip of shops and realized just before I went to door one, no one had actually taught me how to sell yet. I'd spent five days doing product training and it took me 93 doors of getting told to go and get a real job, getting rejected, getting yelled at, getting told I was wasting people's time until somebody finally said, yes, I remember I'd made $70. I was ecstatic for about 80 seconds until I realized I had to do that every single day for the rest of the year. It just wasn't okay for me. So what I did is I went home and I had to find a solution. And the solution that I found, I mean, I couldn't exactly pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book. Firstly, they're built for extroverts. And secondly, 
it would have taken me the year to read them with a reading speed of a sixth grader, let alone to make money. So what I did was I taught myself how to sell on YouTube and I focused on a different step every single day until six weeks later, I was the number one sales performer in the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. It took six weeks. From that, I got promoted about seven times until eventually every time I got promoted, I got a pay cut because I got promoted so quickly and more and more of my commissions came off all of my staff. And because I got promoted, the next manager got the benefit of that, not me. So eventually I made the leap into running my own business. My father said something to me once and it was, I was complaining about it. And he said, Matt, if you think you can do it, you're young, storm the torpedoes, go and do it. So I did. I opened up a small telecommunications company on the top of a subway. It was awesome. It smelled like fresh bread every single day. And next thing I knew, you know, we turned over a million dollars within uh, the space of less than 12 months. And we were a 4.2 million annual revenue just by year three with the largest independent broker for telecommunications in the country. And since then there's been business after business. And for me, what I realized is what I really loved was to, to rapidly grow companies. But yeah, that's, that's my story in a nutshell. So, you know, what's so, so great about, you know, extracting out that success is that, uh, You trained yourself and kind of blew up there. Is that right? Yeah, I think, and this is a really important thing that I think everybody should, should listen to. I mean, you talk about buying real estate and you talk about selling real estate and you talk, tell me just before this that you buy it for, you know, 30 cents in the dollar and you sell it on vendor finance terms, which I'm very familiar with. And that if you had have tried to start with step seven, you would have failed and you would have lost a lot of money. If you had have tried to learn all the steps at once, you would have been over it would have been overcomplicated. It's like I've got a book coming out in January. If I had have tried to focus on the entire book all at once, I would have been overwhelmed. So I focused on creating the skeleton. I focused on working out what the chapters would be. I focused on chapter one. I focused on getting a good draft. And then I focused on perfecting each one of the chapters. I've got an academy that I call Rapid Growth Academy, which People always come into it and they're like, oh, what program should I do with yours? And I'm like, what kind of world are we living in where people focus on doing seven things at once, right? We've just come to terms with the fact that people sell us shiny, shiny objects and we focus on this shiny object, this shiny object. There's no holistic strategy. Well, sales has a holistic strategy. Rapid growth has a holistic strategy. Selling property has a holistic strategy. And the goal is to learn each step not in isolation, but in a sequential order so that when you get to the end, you become an expert. What I found in sales is if I had started with one element or another element and just focused on that or focused on trying to learn them all at once, it would have been overwhelming. So yeah, one step at a time, step by step, I went from having no business being in sales to being the number one sales performer to teaching thousands and now millions through all my platforms of teaching people how to sell. So while I don't focus purely on sales, as a matter of fact, these days I talk about if you start with sales, you've kind of already lost. And we can get into that a little bit later if you like. Realistically- Well, no, let, let's, let's get into it now because I, I want to rapidly grow my land investing business. So uh, walk me through it. <laughs> well, definitely. So what I found is for, for years, people used to ask me to teach them how to sell. And in all of my businesses, you know, my last business was an educational facility. We had three and a half thousand business owners. We're the fastest growing nationally accredited educational facility in the country. And what I found is a lot of people said, hey, Matt, can you teach me how to sell? What I realized is that what I was naturally doing, and this takes a lot of, it's funny, when you become, when you become more of a coach and consultant, you've got to really look at what you were doing naturally and go, why is it what I'm doing work? Sure, the sales thing, I can say, there's a series of steps. And if you just focus on those, because that wasn't natural to me. The part that did come natural was helping people understand, oh, sorry, helping myself understand how to articulate what I did in one simple sentence. For instance, you know, I'm a business coach, I'm a branding expert, I'm a social media strategist, I'm a master in neuro linguistic program. No, I'm too much. No one cares, right? When I say I'm the rapid growth guy, I help organizations large and small obtain rapid growth. The simplicity of that message gets me heard in the crowded market. So, what I realized is being very concise about what I did 
made a difference because instead of going to a networking event and saying, Oh yeah, I sell commercial real estate or I, yeah, I sell residential property or I sell business coaching or I'm a business coach, which means the same thing, right? It's kind of like saying you're an insurance salesperson these days because they know the next step is going to be, do you need what I'm offering you? And right. Right. We've always been to networking events where this happens. You say, Oh yeah, I'm in real estate. Oh great. Awkward pause. And then I say, I'm a business coach. And you say, Oh great. Awkward pause. And then unless either of us specifically want to buy real estate or want to be a uh, business coach, we then wait for a second and make an excuse to go off to the restroom, which everyone in networking events goes to the restroom 200 times and, you know, or go off to get a drink or something like that. Or we have that really awkward conversation about the weather where if you say I'm the rapid growth guy, all of a sudden people are like, I've never heard that. That's something I can't put into a box. How exactly do you do that? Or what exactly is that? Very similar to you. You know, I'm interested in rapid growth. Tell me about it. If I said I was a sales trainer, you'd be like, well, I know what that is, right? So tell me how you're different. Very different conversation. So now I get to explain it on your invitation as opposed to the other way around. The second thing is really understanding the benefit of niche marketing, right? So what I found is by getting those two pillars fixed, by the time you got to sales, it was already much, much easier. So I spent a lot of time teaching introverts and people that don't naturally sell how to sell. And what I found was focusing on step one and two, unified message and niche marketing before we got to sales, the sales process was so much more simple. That's, that's fascinating. What, what, I, what I really uh, like about that is that you've created your own category, right? There are no rapid growth guys, right? Um, and in a way, I've, I've done the same thing with Land Geek. Like there are no other, what's, what's a Land Geek? right? Um, it's memorable. It, 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 inter it interrupts that, that pattern where the mind can't just put you into a box and it's very effective and we can all do it. It just takes a little bit of stepping back and a little thought. So very, very powerful stuff. So, so Matthew, um, all right, so I've created my own category. I've got my niche. Then how do I get to the next step in rapid growth? So I think the important thing is let's, let's use a real example because I think one of the, the things that I find a lot of podcasts, and I, I think I was saying to you before, I think this makes my 90th podcast interview that I've done this year. Uh, but I find a lot of people get on podcasts, they sell these, you know, oh, you know, use this idea, find, find a unified message, discover a niche, learn sales training, and they, they're not tangible. You can't see how that actually affects your business. And what I find is that the best way I can help you get past that is by giving you a really tangible story that really educates you. And one of the things you'll learn in a lot of the things that I do is that I, I generally teach and educate through story. And, you know, I always suggest that everybody should do this because statistically people retain 22 times, I'll say that again, 22 times as much information when it's embedded into a story as they do than just giving us facts. 22 so, times and better information as a story than facts. So I'm trying to do with my, with my email marketing and I'm start, I, I try to tell a quick story and I find the story is too long. And I know like for myself, like I don't want to read a long email. I've got the attention span of a fair to double cappuccino. Just <laughs> give me the good, it's good stuff. But I'm you're right. I, I think the stories are so powerful. So keep going. I'm sorry. Well, you'll notice that. So I'm going to tell you a story now, and then I can tell you that in a blog post, I've summarized this specific story in less than 400 words, right? So one of the things that most people don't understand is how to articulate a story in a way that's laser sharp to get across their value and to get across the moral of the story, which is a, you should really try this because stories are supposed to be to motivate and inspire, not just give detail. But secondly, send the moral that everybody that's listening, whoever's reading this story, I'm awesome. Everybody should know that. Those are the two morals that you're really trying to get across in every story from an email campaign, right? So the story that, you know, that I think will work better to articulate this is, is there was a, a language coach out of California that reached out to me and said, you know, Matt, I'm, I'm really struggling. I've, I'm a language coach. I teach Mandarin to kids and adults and I'm, I'm charging 50 to $80 an hour and I'm losing clients to people that are moving into Los Angeles from other states of the U.S., who are willing to you know, charge $30 to $40 an hour. I mean, we've all been there charging less than what we're worth because we're in a new market and we need our first clients again, right? So they're charging $30 to $40. She's paying her staff more than that. So she's struggling to keep her current clients. She's struggling to get new clients. Worse than that, she's dealing with all these people on Craigslist now. We're in a global economy. There are people from China offering to coach people on Mandarin and clearly they've got ex they're an expert at it for 10 to $20 an hour. So she says, Matt, how do I compete in this already crowded marketplace? And I said, 
Wendy, the goal is not to compete in a crowded marketplace. You'll be, if you're a commodity, it's a long spiral to the bottom. And the only person that wins is the person that's willing to lose because they're the ones that are working for cents in the dollar. I so said, what we need to do is we need to work out how you can avoid the battle altogether. Now, looking at what Wendy was doing, she was helping hundreds of clients. And what I noticed is of all of those people, she was helping two specific people work with, um, she was helping them with much more than just language coaching. The two things, she, uh, three, sorry, the two people she was helping were executives being relocated across to China. Now, she helped them with three predominant things. The first one was really helping them understand this concept of, I, I call it galaxy, which is in, in China, they have a whole different version of rapport. So when I say galaxy, we think we're talking about outer space, but it's their word for rapport. So in the Western world, let's say I was, I, was, I was going to try and sell you something. We'd sit down, we'd have a meeting. And at the end of that meeting, I would say something, if I'm a really bad salesperson, like, hey, would you like to move forward? And you would say something like, yes, which is unlikely from an, abra an abrasive sales pitch like that. Or you'd say, which is more likely because you don't want to hurt my feelings. Let me think about it. A week from now, I'm going to call you back. And the first thing I'm going to say is, hi, how are you doing? Something about the weather. And then, hey, did you want to move forward with that? And you're going to say either yes, or you're going to say you're still thinking about it or no. If you say you're still thinking about it, we know the chances of me getting that sale are going down and down and down, right? Well, that's not yeah. how it works in the Western world. In the Western world, they want to meet with you over dinner, maybe five or six times. They probably don't even want it. They won't even discuss business with you. You, you, mean, that, you mean the Eastern world? Sorry, the Eastern world. Eastern, sorry, my right, apologies. Right. Yeah. So you're talking in China. They want to, they're going to want to meet with you over dinner five or six times. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice just to find out the kind of person you are. And here's why. They're not talking about 12, 24 month or even transactional deals. They're talking 50 to 100 year contracts. These are longer than a lot of people's lifetimes. So for them, it's more important the type of person you are than the deal itself. So they want to get to know that first. So once they get to know that, then they'll happily talk business with you. So it's so important executives know that. There's a big story about a big IT company who's um, you know, a very close um, sponsor for one of my things. So I'm not going to mention their specific name, but uh, they were negotiating a billion dollar contract with the Chinese government. And by meeting three, they said, look, we just, I know we've, we're having a great time, but I'm tired of talking about my kids. Can we start talking about technology? They listened to them, heard them out, thanked them, wish them well and never let them call the office again, right? Never would answer the phone, um, never would call them back. The deal was dead. The second thing she helped them understand was the, the difference between e-commerce in the East and e-commerce in the West. And the third thing was the importance of respect. See, in the Eastern world, it's very, very different. For instance, if in the Western world, if you were to hand me a business card, I would grab that card and I'd put it in my pocket and I'd keep talking to you. At a networking event, I might do that a hundred times. And then I get home and I pull out all these cards and I, don't, I can't even connect them to people's faces. In the Eastern world, the goal is that you have to hold the card, look at the card, cherish the card, stare at the card, turn it over, appreciate the detail of the back before pulling out a card case, putting it in, then bowing, and then putting it away. Anything less than that, it's disrespectful. You're just not doing business in China. I mean, I... I just got back from speaking earlier this year at the Electrolux conference in Bangkok. And, you know, there were a hundred vice presidents in that room and all of them, when I handed them my card, did exactly that. Anything less than that is disrespectful. So you're not doing business with them. The same as if you can learn Mandarin, but if you don't reduce your accent, again, it's seen as disrespectful. So she helped them understand that. And I said, Wendy, you're doing so much more for these people than just private language coaching. What are you doing? She said, man, I'm just trying to help. Now, I bet every single person listening, probably yourself as well, you do so many things above and beyond for your clients that you probably don't talk about in the initial sales pitch or in your initial marketing, right? They're the unique competencies that you have. I mean, everyone's got unique competencies, unique upbringings, unique experiences, unique education that they draw on that allows them to help people. And for Wendy, these experiences allowed her to help these two executives being relocated to China. I said, Wendy, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume that as a result of the help you're giving these people, these people are going to be more successful when they get to China? She said, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the hope. I said, great. Why wouldn't we call you the China success coach? Why wouldn't we call your business the China success institute? And why would we not call your product? Forget about language coach. Who cares? I mean, those are people that are charging $10 an hour now. Why wouldn't we give you a product called the China success intensive? which was a five week program that worked with the executive, the spouse and the children to help them be successful when they were relocated to China. 
Now, why the spouse and the children? Firstly, we're in business, we can charge more. But secondly, think about it. If you're an executive being relocated to China and your wife or husband and child is not happy when they get there, you're gonna get called home. Your chances of being successful are much less. So it was important that the whole family unit was successful. So she said, I love this, this is great. How do I sell it? And I said, well, tell me who your customer is. So now we're talking, now we've got the unified message. We've got the product. We had the packaging and the pricing. We're now looking for who our niche is. And she said, oh, that's right, it's the executive. I said, no. She said, oh, the corporation. I said, no. I said, think about it. If you're a person getting relocated to China, where do you have to go before you get relocated? She said, well, an immigration attorney. I mean, when I came and got my visa, I had to go and see an immigration attorney. Then I had to go and back to get my green card. So we met a load of immigration attorneys and, and she said that she would give them a commission of $3,000 for any successful introduction. And she, they said, well, that's great, you know, because I charge $3,000 to $4,000 to do all that paperwork, all that bureaucracy, plus I have to find the client. This is $3,000 worth of additional pure profit. What would I have to say? And we said, simple. All you'd have to do is say, congratulations, you've now got your visa. Now, I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated across to China. And they'd say, well, yeah, I think so. I mean, we've got our place organized. I'm learning Mandarin. The kids are getting pretty good at it too. We've got our visa. I think we're set. And she would simply say, or they would simply say, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. Wendy would get on this phone with somebody that's terrified about be re being relocated. I mean, I moved to America. I was terrified. Imagine getting moved to a country that doesn't even speak the same language. So they were terrified. The corporation had a lot of money invested. They were very happy to go through Wendy to make sure that they were as successful as possible when they got there. And Wendy had the easiest sale in the world that she got to charge $30,000 for. It was a $30,000 five week program. She made $27,000 after commission to have the easiest sale in the world instead of struggling every day to charge 50 to $80. So yes, Wendy could have learned how to sell better. And I would have made Wendy probably close twice to three times as many deals just focusing on sales. But by focusing on the unified message, the niche market, before we got to sales, sales skills weren't actually that required. The sale was easily made because the customer was already sold on the fact that they wanted to be successful when they got there and we were targeting the right people. So that's why I say, if you start with sales, you've already lost. I love it. Uh, there's a great book. Uh, you probably read it, Matthew, uh, called The Blue Ocean Strategy. Mm -hmm. Have you read this? It is a very good book, yes. Good book. So, I mean, you know, you're, so basically what you're saying is, look, there's no need to compete. Create your own blue ocean. And a red ocean is one that's got tons of competition and everyone's competing. No, create your own blue ocean. And a lot of times what you can do is you combine two um, industries and then lower your overhead. So a good example is Cirque du Soleil. Right, they, they took the theater and then they took the circus, they got rid of the animals, right? They created a whole new niche where you have, who, you have uh, adults going to the theater and you've got kids going to the circus. Everyone can go to Cirque du Soleil and you raise the price, you lower your overhead and you've got a blue ocean and no one's competing. Definitely, I think one of the, the interesting things and blue ocean strategy, there are two types of blue ocean strategies, if you like. So the one that you just described was, I have a functional skill, find a new niche, and use my functional skill to work with that niche. The difference here is that what we're looking at is blue oceans that utilize our competencies outside the scope of our functional skill, right? So they still wanted to work in, they, they wanted to be people in a circus, right? With Wendy, these, she didn't have to go back to school. She didn't have to go and learn new skills. She didn't have, she, what she had to do was look at the skill set she already had and find a new market for that. Now, these days, and I'll just explain the difference in marketing theory. So most people believe that you've got to find an unmet need in the marketplace. Then you craft a message for that market and then you create the sales system. Now the problem with Wendy, for instance, she's a professional service provider. So because of that, if she bends herself to the market, which is what that's asking you to do, it feels incongruent. It feels inauthentic. So instead, what I do is I always say that what you need to do is craft your business around your passions, your goals, your why. Okay, another good book around that would be Simon Sinek's Start With Why, right? I, lo I love that book. So it's a very good book for doing, for understanding what your why is. But what he doesn't tell you is that if you don't know your why, it's generally because you have a disconnect from your own personal goals, right? So what happens is we teach ourselves that 
we have to do what's safe. We learn this from when we're really young. That we have to do what's safe. So we end up focusing, we inherit our goals from our mother, our father, our drunk roommate we had in college. And we're like, oh, that sounds like a great goal. I'm going to charge at that. And either we don't really care and it doesn't light us on fire or we are really um, you know, focused and we do hit that goal and then it doesn't make us happy, right? And a lot of people focus on doing the thing that they think they can make money out of as opposed to what they're truly passionate about. The most important thing is to come back to understanding what you truly want and why it's important to you. Once you have that, you can then start to really tap into what you're passionate about and then look at your why statements. Once you know your whys, you then build a unified message around your why. And then you go and look for unmet needs in the marketplace. Now, in the past, we used to have to say, well, is there enough market for what we do? inside my city or my postcode because other or my zip code because otherwise I can't sell. These days we live in a global marketplace. So there's always enough market out there. If there's one customer in your local area, there's likely to be thousands globally. So the, there are two major things that I would love people to know. Firstly, Jim Carrey has a famous quote, which is you can fail at what you don't want. So why not take a chance at what you love? And secondly, you may not know the direct route there. Most people fail because most people don't start because they see a few red lights along the way and they won't take action. That's why there's not enough successful entrepreneurs out there because unless all the lights are green, they won't move forward or they try and hedge by going to the safe route, but then they're not passionate about it. There's no wide driver. They're bending themselves to the market and it just doesn't work. So my focus is always to use, understand what your passions and why are. I mean, for Wendy, she called us, you know, she focused on galaxy. She focused on e-commerce. She focused on respect. No one cares about that stuff, but they did care about the high level benefit of China success. That message got her heard in a crowded market, but that was aligned with her skill sets, her passions, her why it's actually the part she enjoyed doing more than even teaching language. So you've got to tap into what's truly important to you and why it's important to you before you can even look at a Simon Sinek start with why. And then once you've got that why, you then need to understand that you need to, you need to explain that in a simple, specific way with a unified message that, in, that inspires people to want to know more like people do with Wendy or me or a videographer that I call the narrative strategist where people go, I've never heard that before. What exactly is that? And then you get to explain it on their invitation. Then the sales process is easier. I love it. I love it. I could, I could talk to you all day, Matthew, but we're at that point now in the podcast where I got to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Your mentorship has been amazing, but now this, I'm this for one more. Questions. Well, the first thing is my tip of the day is a, I'm actually going to read my favorite quote, which is you decide every moment of every day who you are and what you believe in. You get a second chance every second. Now, the reason why that's such a profound quote to me is not- Wait, who, said, who said that quote? I actually don't have the author. It's listed by unknown. Um, oh, wow. But it's a cool quote, right? So it's great. So the reason why I find that I really love that quote and it resonates with me. Now, some people that are highly religious go, well, you can't change your religious beliefs all the time. I'm not saying it's not about that. But most people just define the success they can have in the future by the success they've had in the past. Every day is a new, every second is a new. Stop defining yourself by your stories. I could have continually told people, oh, I've got a reading speed of a sixth grader, I can't be successful. I could continually tell people, oh, I'm, not, I'm an introvert, I can't sell. You redefine who you are every single second. You know, all of my success until I turned 30 was 100% outbound marketing, direct salespeople, tally marketers. When I came to the US, I'm gonna go, 100% online. And when I did that nine months later, I was an internationally award-winning blogger, right? It's about making a decision about who you are every single day and not saying, oh, I've not done that before, so I can't do that. I, I love it. I love it. Great, great quote. All right, my tip of the week is learn more about the Rapid Growth Coach at matthewpollard.com um, or rapidgrowthcoach.com, right, Matthew? Exactly. Yeah. You can it, pretty much type my name in Google or rapid growth in Google and everything comes up with my name. So you won't find it hard to find me. All right. Fantastic. Um, I just want to remind the listeners, the only way, the only way we're getting the quality of guests like a Matthew Pollard is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at the We're going to send you for free 
the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. Matthew Pollard, are we good? Mate, I think we've had a great time. I hope everyone got what they were looking for out of today. And I think it, it was a great interview, mate. So thank you for letting me share it with you. Yeah, thank you. I will definitely have to have you back again. There's, there's so much to talk about. Um, I mean, marketing is, is kind of endless. Um, I'd love to know, as of today, live stream on Facebook. If you're doing like a, like a marketing strategy, um, is there one in particular that, that's like a ninja strategy that you're doing right now for rapid growth? So one of the things that I always suggest to people when you're talking ninja strategy is stop buying Facebook ads. Seriously, stop buying them. One of the major things, people build products and they're like, oh, if I buy Facebook ads, everybody will buy them and then I'm going to be rich. I built my brand on not spending a single dollar on Facebook ads, on Twitter ads. One of the things that I focus on is sharing great, creating great content. Now, not a lot of it. Like my, you, know, you can create 10 blog posts and create great content and share those. But be very active on social media. Share video if you can. So if you're doing Facebook Live, share videos, but 45 seconds most and make very clear, here is what I'm sharing with you today. Here is the value bomb. And here is the action that I want you to take as a result of watching this video. Everyone forgets the action piece or people try and put seven things into one video. Now we've got a 40 minute video that no one watches. 45 seconds is about your ideal time. But if you stick to 45 seconds, don't forget, here's what I want you to do. It could be click on this link to buy. Could be click on when I was completely, you know, offline focused. I didn't use social media. I didn't even know what Twitter was for. Right? I didn't use Facebook for anything. Now, you know, I drive thousands of people to my site, and make a six-figure income out of social media without paying the ads gods. Right? So you don't need to do that. You just need to have a strong strategy on how to. Do I love it. it. I love it. Well, Matthew Pollard, this is great. Um, I want to thank all the listeners again. Go to rapidgrowthcoach.com, matthewpollard.com. Learn more. Let. Freedom ring. All right. Thanks, Matthew.